Okay, Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, the glorious Jesus. This is lesson 11 in that series. A title of this, the glory of the church of Christ. That's the title of this particular lesson. And we'll be looking at Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 19. That's our passage that we'll examine tonight. Uh, we'll also be putting uh, those passages, uh, passages up on the, uh, on the screen. So let's kind of review just a little bit here. Let us uh, kind of go back to what we're talking about. Remember I said Hebrews is one of the easiest books to outline. There are only two parts. Um, the first part talks about the glorious Jesus. Chapter 1, 1 to chapter 10, 18. It's all about the glorious Jesus, how Jesus is greater than all the elements of the Jewish religion. And then the second part of Hebrews is the glorious church of Jesus, or the glorious church of Christ, and that's from chapter 10, 19, all the way to the end, chapter 13, uh, 25. So as you know, the author here uh, is going to bring uh, the lesson home to his readers. He has warned his readers um, about falling back uh, in the uh, previous sections of the book and the terrible consequences for one who, after having known the Lord, abandons the Lord. Remember, these Jewish Christians were being tempted to go back to their old ways, go back, not to the world, but go back to Judaism and uh, you know, practice the Jew uh, Jewish religion. And the writer is exhorting them and telling them, don't go back to the Jewish religion. Uh, Jesus is greater than the Jewish religion. And then he goes about for the first 10 chapters of the book to show them how Jesus is greater than the Jewish religion, greater than Moses, greater than the angels, greater than the law, greater than the sacrifices, and so on and so forth. So it's been a bit of a negative thing. I mean, he's, he's talking positively about Christ, but he's kind of talking negatively to the readers and warning them, boy, don't, if this is so, don't do this, don't go back, don't abandon the Lord. From here on in, he's going to start exhorting them in a positive way showing them what they ought to be doing. So first 10 chapters, you should not be doing this. The last three chapters, this is what you should be doing. And the point is uh, that he's making, if Jesus is superior to the Jewish faith and the system of the Jewish faith, then his people, his church, well, it's glorious as well. I mean, if Jesus is glorious, then His body is glorious, you see. So as the church of the glorious Christ, they must shine forth also, and the author emphasizes two important qualities of this glorious church of Jesus Christ. And the two things that he talks about, he says, Jesus' church glorifies Jesus by being faithful and by being holy. And that's the kind of summary of what he's going to talk about in the last couple of chapters. Now in this lesson, uh, we're going to look at the section on the faithfulness part of the glorious church of the Lord as this writer explains it. Now the Lord, he says, glorifies his church with all of his qualifications. He glorifies his church with all of the service that he renders to the church and on behalf of the church that the author has mentioned throughout all these chapters. Now he turns it around and he says, so the Lord you know, glorifies the body in this way, so now this is how the body is going to glorify the Lord. And the first thing he mentions, as I said, is the church glorifies Jesus through faithfulness. And this faithfulness is expressed as a sort of a confidence. So you know, we, don't, we don't glorify Jesus with you know, big buildings or you know, showy you know, spectacles and things like that. Seems in this day and age you know, people are confusing you know, religion with show business. Religion is not show business. You know, it doesn't matter how loud you sing, doesn't matter how, you know, how excited people get you know, when they all get together, it doesn't matter if you have 10,000 people you know, uh, gathering, that this is all well and good, but this is not how God you know, determines the value of His people. The author here says, 
God determines the value of His people through their faithfulness. Now it's great if you've got 10,000 faithful people, though. That's, that's wonderful. Okay, but just having 10,000 people together you know, to, 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 to have a religious experience, you know, that's, that's not necessarily um, what God is uh, looking for. So let's read uh, verse 19 and 20. He says, therefore, therefore meaning you know, I, 10 chapters, if you understand that Jesus is greater than the Jewish religion, therefore, he says, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which He inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, His flesh. And so uh, he's saying, you ought to be faithful, and this faithfulness ought to be expressed in confidence. Why? Why? The question isn't there, it's, you know, it's inferred, if you wish. Well, because Christ has opened a new way to come before God. The old way, you know, the priest was there. The, 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 the old way, you know, offering dead animal sacrifices, they didn't give man access to the throne of God. It only reminded man of his estrangement, his weakness, his condemnation, his death. The old system of sacrifice simply reminded you that you were a sinner and that you were lost and you couldn't even come close to God. I mean, only the priest could go before God once a year. But the new way, the author writes, the new way gives us confidence and not fear brings us into the very presence of God and not just the outer court where Jewish men could be, and gives us life, not death. Now, if we have confidence because of, what, uh, because of Jesus and what He has done, then what does this confidence move us to do? Well, he answers that question in verse 21 and 22. He says, and since we have a great priest over the household of God, this is Jesus, of course, let us draw near with a sincere heart, full assurance of faith, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So what does this confidence lead us to do? Well, first of all, it allows us to draw near to God with faith. Jesus is the priest that ministers for us, so unlike the Jews, the Christians, they should draw near to God with a sincere heart, free of fear, free of ignorance or guilt or sin, because the Christian is free from sin that causes these things. You know, we talked about the, uh, you know, the high priest in the Old Testament. I mean, even the high priest could not enter the Holy of Holies in this way with confidence, because he was you know, because he was unclean. He had to first offer a sacrifice for his own self before he could come uh, forward. And that was on the outside. But on the inside, I mean, he was still guilty like everybody else. He wasn't really any better than any of the people that he was offering a sacrifice for. Inside his heart, his heart had not yet been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. The priest's water purification rites, they cleaned the outside, but baptism signals the cleansing of the inside. That's what Peter is talking about in 1 Peter 2, you know, 1 Peter 3 rather, you know, that baptism is an appeal to God for a clean conscience. Well, you know, that's the cleaning of the inside. So he's saying, you know, because Jesus is your high priest, you can just march right into the throne room of God with confidence. Why? Because your conscience is clean. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be ashamed. You don't have to offer some other kind of sacrifice. And so because of our faith, we can, we can enter the throne room of God with confidence. Secondly, he says, let us hold fast our confession of hope. So he says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. I mean the confession, you know when he says the confession, let, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Those are the religious beliefs that we hold to, that Jesus is the Son of God, that His sacrifice you know, washes away our sins, all those things. That's our confession that he's talking about, our religious beliefs, which our religious beliefs give us hope. 
So don't doubt the reality of the promises made by God to us through Christ. Why? Because God is faithful and He's able to fulfill those promises for good or bad. I mean, the one who said, let there be light, and <laughs> there was a billion stars, you know. If He can do that, He can raise your dead body out of the ground. Don't doubt it. And if He can do that, He can also put your body into hell forever. Don't doubt that either. And so the hope that they would be resurrected, the hope that they would have eternal life and so on and so forth, all of these promises, the writer is saying, the, this type of hope was sure because it was based on God's promise and they were not to doubt His promise. You know, he says, don't waver. You know, if it's true today, it's true tomorrow, it'll be true the next day. Remember what I mentioned in previous classes, these promises don't depend on us, they depend on Him. Let us also, he says, consider one another in love. So he says, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I know we use this passage as a proof text to make sure that everybody comes to church. You know, don't forsake the assembly, and that's true, but that's not what this passage is about in context. This passage is about love. That's what this passage is about. While they approach God faithfully and are secure in their hope, they are to encourage each other with and towards good deeds and with loving regard one for another. The idea is, hey, we're all going to heaven, let's be nice to each other. <laughs> you know? Used to say that to uh, our kids when they were growing up and they'd be fussing with each other. Or they'd say you know, nasty things to each other, you know, sisters to brothers, you know, knew how to cut their brothers down to size. You know, I'd say, hey guys, relax, because the people outside this house, out in the world, yeah, they won't need much of an excuse to knock you down and to talk badly about you and to insult you and to hurt you. They won't need much of an excuse to do that. So the four of you, you better stick together and be kind to each other, because that's the family you got. You better stick with that family, okay? And so that's what he's saying here. Hey, the people outside these church walls and the unbelievers, the pagan society that we live in, the worldliness around us, I mean, all of that stuff's going to be dragging you down, going to be pulling you away is going to be hurting you. So don't hurt each other. <laughs> Encourage each other, help each other, support each other, love each other. Because it's a, it's a nasty world out there. And so some, you know, he's writing here, the, the writer is writing with knowledge of these particular people, and he says some of them had drawn back from God. They had given up hope, they had abandoned the faith, and this was evident because they had not come to the assemblies. That's where that fits in. You know, not coming to the assemblies, you know, worship, service, Bible study, that's a barometer of spiritual health. It doesn't tell you everything, you know what I'm saying? But somebody who never comes to church you know, and professes to know Christ, you know, really doesn't know Christ. A lot of reasons why we can't come, we're sick, we work, and so on and so forth, but you know what I'm saying. Some people just don't come because they don't feel like coming. They come once every you know, three months or two weeks or five weeks or something. They're sporadic. Well, that's, you know, in my experience, I've never seen these as giants of the faith. You know? Why? Well, you, it's a barometer. It's just like you go for a checkup. What's the first thing they do when you go to the doctor? They take your temperature. One of the very first things they, why? Because it's an indicator. If you're running a fever, okay, something's wrong. If you don't come to church, if you don't attend services, then something's wrong, okay? So that's what he's saying, you know. Don't get into that habit. He tells them to encourage one another, not necessarily just to come to church, but rather encourage one another while they are in the church. That's what should be happening, so that people will not be discouraged and leave the church. A lot of times the most encouragement people ever get and the most visits they ever get is when they don't come to church. 
The elders call them, the deacons call them, the members call them, hey, I haven't seen you in a while, come on back, blah, blah, blah. And the thing that I hear the most from the people who haven't been coming for a while is, how come you didn't talk to me while I was there? <laughs> while I was there, you didn't encourage me. While I was there, you didn't know my name. While I was there, you didn't bother to find out who I was. But now that I've stopped coming, now you're interested in who I am. So that's what he's saying. While you're together, encourage each other. Help each other stick at it. We don't want people to be discouraged and leave the church. If people are not encouraged by, by loving attention and teaching and help and so on and so forth while they're in the assembly, all the encouragement to come to the assembly will not bring them back. And they should all do this, the writer says, as they see the day drawing near. So what is the day drawing near? Well, it can be three things. It can be the day, the Lord's day. Encourage each other as the Lord's day. You know, it's going to be Sunday, you, know, you need to come. It's Wednesday, it's Friday. You know. Or it can mean the destruction of Jerusalem as you see the day coming, that day for the Jews. Or it can mean, it can mean the day, that, you know, eschatologically, it can mean you know, the day, the end day. Jesus returns. You know, encourage each other to stay faithful. You never know, Jesus can be coming at any time. I think, just a personal opinion, I think this passage here refers to the return of Jesus, since these Jewish people that he's writing to, uh, they lived outside of Palestine and they could not witness the signs that Jesus spoke of in Matthew 24 that would point towards the event of the destruction of Jerusalem. So obviously he's not talking to those people. Also probably doesn't refer to the Lord's day because the author is discussing what they ought to be doing within the assembly itself and not merely you know, having to attend. So is it right to use this as a proof text you know, to encourage people to be faithful to church? Of course, it does say that. But it's not about just that. <clears throat> it's more about what we ought to be doing to people who are actually coming to church so that they will not stop coming to church. And so Christians should be confident, why? because Christ has prepared a new life-giving way for them to come to God, and this new confidence should spurn them to express this boldness. How? Come on, there we go. By drawing near to God in faith, without fear. By being strong in their hope, without doubt. Now, I never apologize for having confidence that I'm going to heaven. I never say, you know, some say, uh, what do you think about the future? Well, I'm going to heaven. I, th I think I'm going to heaven. I, well, I sure hope I'm going to heaven. You know, no, I didn't do that. I am going to heaven. Why am I so sure? Because God said so. And I've just taken him at his word. Why should I doubt that? I'm not beating myself up with that. How can I inspire confidence in you if I myself am not sure of what God has given me? And then, of course, encourage each other in love without hesitation, without holding back. You know, the, preaching the gospel you know, is what brings people into the church, but it's love that keeps them in the church. And sometimes we forget that. So the author encourages the faithful to boldly go forward, not to retreat, because to retreat has terrible consequences. Verse 26, 27 <clears throat> goes on. He says, for if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there's no longer, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the spirit of grace? So the author you know, uh, goes on to, you know, to talk now the flip side of this. He's been encouraging them. He, you know, then he talks about the punishment for unfaithfulness. He says, there is a sacrifice for those who sin and need forgiveness, but there is no sacrifice for those who know the truth 
and despite this go on willfully sinning. The only thing there is for these people is judgment and punishment. There's a difference, by the way, between the act of sin and the state of sin, different thing. You know, even as Christians, the most, uh, you know, the strongest Christian who tries to you know, do their best and so on and so forth, will at, at times, even every day, commit acts of sin. Lose my temper, say the wrong word, you know, lust, whatever, you know, acts of sin. He's talking about the state of sin. This is a sin, I like this sin, I'm continuing this sin, I'm not about to give up this sin, nobody's going to tell me what to do, you know, blah, blah, blah. That's the state of sin. That's what he's warning against. And not just committed acts, although these are included, but also the sin of falling away from the faith after having accepted the faith. You know, abandoning the assembly is merely the sign that one has gone away from the faith. It's the symptom. It's not the disease that kills you, it's the symptom of the disease. And then I read from 28 and 29 here, as we said, and one more verse, and he says, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. So a final comparison between Jesus and the Jewish religion. He says, the author states that since Jesus is greater than the Jewish religion, the sin of abandoning him is greater than the sin of abandoning the Jewish religion, and so will be punished. Now you need to understand, in the Jewish faith, a sinner was punished without mercy or uh, on the testimony of his guilt by two or three human witnesses. That was the law. Under the new covenant, one who abandons Christ has done the following things. He has, as the author stated, held up to contempt God's own son. In other words, God's own son, not good enough to remain faithful to. That's contemptuous. You, know. you came, you died for me, I understood that, I came to you, and then I just left you. That's contempt. Secondly, that individual has considered the blood or the sacrifice no better than any other sacrifice. And in this context, he's saying, boy, you abandoned Jesus to go back to Judaism. You're saying the blood of bulls and goats is better than the blood of Christ? See the context of that? And then he says, the third thing you've done is rejected the Spirit. When you were baptized, what happened to you? The Spirit of God began to dwell in you. And so by abandoning Christianity, going back to Judaism, you have rejected that spirit. You have rejected the influence that that spirit has done. Now remember, I'm telling you this in context. The sin that he's talking about here is not drunkenness or adultery or whatever. He's talking about abandoning Christ for another form of religion. In this case, it was Judaism. But I've known people who have abandoned Christ because they love booze more, or they love dope more, or they love you know, their girlfriend more in the sense of you know, they had a wife, but they love the girlfriend more. Or they love gambling, you know what I'm saying, whatever, whatever sin it is. You know, they just love that thing a lot more than they love Christ, you know, so they leave Christ and love that thing. Well, these people here were abandoning Christ to do what? To go back to their old religion. They love that thing more than they love Christ. And the writer here is calling them on it and saying, you know, if you do this, this is actually what you're doing. And here's an interesting point. These sins here, you know, uh, holding God's Son in contempt and uh, disdain for the sacrifice, rejecting the Holy Spirit, these sins were not even possible under the law of Moses in the Old Testament period. <laughs> if you lived you know, in the time of Moses, it was impossible for you to commit these sins. Why? Well, the blood of Christ hadn't been shed for you yet. The Spirit hadn't been given. So you couldn't, you couldn't make these sins if you were a Jew living at the time of the Old Testament before Jesus came. So his point is this, he's saying, if God punished men for lesser offenses in the Old Testament, stealing, killing, adultery, whatever, if God punished men for lesser offenses, how much greater the offense and punishment for the one who commits such things, especially knowing that only a saved person could commit such sins. 
A pagan cannot commit these sins. And a Jew living before Christ could not commit these sins. So he's saying, wow, this is why the punishment is greater. Verse 31, he says, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. So for the faithful child of God, it is a wonderful and reassuring thing to be in the hands of God. But for the rebel, for the one who knowingly rejects Christ, that same position is terrifying because God has absolute power to destroy this person. So after warning them of the terrible consequences of falling away, the writer more gently encourages them to carry on and to endure. And so we read in verses 32, he says, but remember the former days when, after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. So here the writer reminds them of their attitude of endurance demonstrated when they first came to the Lord. He's saying, you know, remember back the old days when you first became Christians? Well, let's go back to that attitude. Let's go back to that feeling. And he reminds them of some of the things that happened when these people first became Christians. They were ridiculed publicly. They continued to associate with other believers who were also badly treated. They ministered to Christians who were jailed at that time, um, an obligation that the church took very seriously at that time, ministering to Christians who had been in prison because of their faith. And he says also they suffered the loss of their property because of their faith. Now in those days, outlawed religions had no protection of the state, and during religious persecution, many were looted um, uh, or lost their property. And so the author reminds them that they endured joyfully this terrible thing because their hope for a better home was very strong at the beginning. So in verse 35 he continues and says, therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. In other words, you were enduring while, going, you know, while the going was rough at the beginning. Don't throw away your confidence now, he reminds them. The reward is still to come. You haven't got your reward yet. And then in verse 36 he says, for you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God you may receive what was promised. They need to continue until the end in the same way that they started so that they can receive the promises made to them from the very beginning. We talked about that in the previous chapters. They need endurance um, because doing God's will is not always easy and it often causes conflicts then as well as now. Nothing has changed. Verse 37 he says, for yet in a very little while he who is coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. So here he quotes Old Testament passages to encourage them. Most of the quote here is taken from the prophet Habakkuk, chapter two, verses three and four, where this prophet was crying out to God, asking why God allowed foreign oppressors to trample on the Israelites at that time. And God's response was that no matter what was happening, God was still in charge and that in time, He would destroy the wicked. As for His people, they would survive and they would receive their reward if they remained faithful. And, and this writer here is, is going back hundreds of years and saying, look, you guys are not experiencing anything that some of these other faithful people have not experienced in the past. And look how God spoke to them and look at the promise God made to them. Well, it's the same thing for you people today. And so the author uses the passage, as I say, as a parallel encouragement to, their, to these Jewish Christians who had suffered persecution and discouragement. He tells them, endure faithfully and God will rescue you and will reward you in time. And he also notes that God takes pleasure not in the suffering of His people, but in the reaction to the suffering that His people have. 
God takes no pleasure in the fact that we suffer. The pleasure He takes is in the fact that we remain faithful despite the suffering that we have. Then in verse 39, He says, but we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to, uh, to the preserving of the soul. He summarizes his thoughts by saying, we're not quitters who go back to the old, to the destruction, but we go forward by faith towards complete redemption and eternal life. So let me just summarize here a little bit what we've talked about. First of all, the author has shown how glorious Jesus is. Then he talks about how glorious the church is. And the church demonstrates this glory by drawing near to God with confidence now that Jesus has opened the way to the throne room of God through His sacrifice. And He tells them to glorify Jesus by holding on to your hope without wavering since it's hope is built on God's promises. That's a sure thing. And then He, provide, he tells them to provide loving encouragement one to another because the going is tough and we need to encourage each other, not discourage each other. Then he warns them. He warns the church that abandoning Christ is a greater sin than abandoning Moses. Abandoning Moses was a sin that you'd be condemned for, but abandoning Jesus is a worse sin because in Christ you have much better rewards. And then the author encourages them to finish the race with the same zeal that they began with so that they can receive the rewards that God has promised. So these Christians, as well as every disciple until the end of time, were learning the basic lessons about Christian life. And I leave you with these very quickly before the next bell. Here are the lessons, basic things, the ABCs of the Christianity. Number one, it's easy to begin, but it's so hard to finish. Easy to begin, so, you know, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. Baptism, in the water, up you go, shake hands, we love you, let's hold hands, let's pray, let's be introduced, I'm a new Christian, I'm going to heaven, yes! That's the beginning. <laughs> but then there's persecution, there's choices you need to make, there's things you need to give up, there's like a dry period spiritually, sometimes it's boring, sometimes it's inconvenient. Sometimes you want something desperately, but you can't have it. Sometimes God is not answering your prayers right away, whatever. Between the start and the finish, there's all this stuff here. So it's easy to start, but it's not so easy to finish. That's lesson number one in Christianity. And I tell people, you know, say, hey, don't be surprised. Don't get mad at God, don't be surprised, because everybody knows who's been a Christian for any amount of time, it's easy to start, it's finishing that's tough. Second basic law in Christianity. The decision to continue persevering must be made every single day. And the decision is nothing is going to get in my way from finishing the race, nothing. There's no person, there's no sin, there's no temptation, there's no thing, person, situation, nothing. You have to be ruthless. Nothing gets in my way. You know, how did Jesus say it? You got to hate your mother, your father, your brother. You know, anybody that gets in your way from finishing has got to get out of the way. And you have to make that decision every single day. Am I a Christian or not? And what does that mean for me today? And then the third uh, basic law of Christianity, the rewards are only for those who finish. In the Christian race, it's not how fast you run, it's if you finish or not. Because there are plenty of times in the race you're not running very fast. You ever do that? I'm going out for a five mile run and then after about a mile and a half you get that cramp in your leg, whatever, and then you're kind of hobbling along. You know. And then maybe you trot home. So we don't always run the whole race at the same speed. It's not how fast you run. It's if you finish or not. That's the important thing. All right, so that's the Lesson number 11 in this series, and we'll continue on uh, next time we meet. Thank you for your attention.